Hello everyone, I'm Heath, and tonight what I thought I would do is I would sit here with the One Ring role-playing game, this is the second edition of the rules, and see what it's like creating a character, because I have really wanted to create a One Ring character here and go through the process for some time, and I figure that, hey, it's about time to try to make that happen. So I have got uh, the physical rule book sitting here with me at the desk, I have the digital rule book, uh, the PDF of it, pulled up here on the computer screen, and then I was also able to to download some character sheets that are fillable, fillable PDFs that we can also use up here on screen. And I'm hoping that that is a, a pretty easy way to uh, record this process and try to go along with it. I've never created a character before in this, although we've been through some of the rules, the starter box set, but this is the actual core rules here. So the following pages show you how to craft a player hero drawn from one of the six cultures. Now, I have actually read through this chapter before. Uh, two or maybe three weeks ago now, I read through the, the chapter on character creation because I wanted to go through it here uh, with you on YouTube. Uh, and so, actually, one thing that I remember is that the, your selection of different uh, races that you can create characters for was a bit more limited than I was expecting because I was going to sit here and I was going to create maybe a Knight of Rohan. That's one of my favorite types of characters from Lord of the Rings or also actually one of my very favorites are the Swan Knights of Dol Amroth. But neither one of them are actually options here. It's very Eriador focused and so it says that we have six heroic cultures from which to choose from. So, all right, so to create a character, each player must first choose a heroic culture, selecting one that is closest to the hero concept they have in mind. All cultures present in this volume belong to the free peoples, brave nations that refuse the darkness and are often at open war with it. They represent the main choices for role-playing in the Westlands of Eriador. And so these options are Bardings, Dwarves of Durin's Folk, Elves of Linden, Hobbits of the Shire, Men of Bree, or Rangers of the North. So of those different options, being that I can't be a Knight of Rohan or a Swan Knight of Dol Amroth, I'm going to go with Dwarves of Durin's Folk. And so over here on the download, this is the the One Ring Dwarf character sheet. And actually, I'm not even sure what the difference is between the different character sheets for different, what are they calling these? These are calling uh, heroic cultures, but they did have dwarf. And so I was like, well, all right, given those options, I would probably play a dwarf. So we're gonna create a dwarf character. Once they have made their choice, players refer to the appropriate heroic culture write-ups and follow the steps described below, copying all information onto their character sheet. Record your cultural blessing, determine your attributes, choosing a set or rolling success dice, calculate your strength, heart, and wits target numbers. Each target number is equal to 20 minus its corresponding attribute. That's probably going to be important to remember. Calculate your derived stats, endurance, hope, and parry. Record your skill and combat proficiency rankings. Choose your distinctive features. Choose a name and age. Answer the call to adventure. Players finalize their character creation process by moving on to page 44 and applying the steps described below. Choose a calling from among captain, champion, messenger, scholar, treasure hunter, and warden. Spend previous experience points. Choose your starting gear. Record your valor and wisdom score at one and choose your starting reward and virtue. And then all players cooperate in adding details about how their newly created adventurers meet each other and formed a company. See page 51. A company may be composed of adventurers of any kind, but the sum of its parts is going to be influenced by the player hero's selection of heroic culture and calling. All right, heroic cultures here. So we've got to choose a heroic culture. And we know there are three attributes in the One Ring, strength, heart, and wits. We basically know what strength, heart, and wits are from the other videos that we've gone through uh, where we went through that uh, the basic boxed set. So strength, toughness, and fit, heart, capacity for emotion and enthusiasm, wits, clever, attentive, or ingenious. Each attribute TN is equal to 20 minus its corresponding attribute score. There is that again. Combat and co skills and combat proficiencies. Skills represent those abilities that adventurers employ most often while combat proficiencies reflect the expertise of the player hero in fighting. The competence of a player hero is represented by a rating, rating from zero to six. Distinctive features are typically displayed by heroes from a given culture and are used to add nuance to personality. Okay, we do have notes on languages here. 
Okay, so here we are with the heroic cultures. Okay, so bardings, uh, dwarves of Durin's folks. That's what we said we were going to create here based on these options. So I'm going to create a dwarf of Durin's folk. So here is my cultural blessing then, redoubtable. Dwarves make light of burdens, especially when it comes to wearing armor. You have the load rating of any armor you're wearing, rounding fractions up, including helms, but not shields. Gimli the dwarf alone wore openly a shirt of steel rings, for dwarves make light of such burdens. The Nogrim, dwarves are shorter than men, but their work as miners and smiths endows them with powerful arms and shoulders, yet they still favor shorter weapons over longer ones. Dwarven adventurers cannot use the following pieces of war gear, great bow, great spear, and great shield. Okay. Standard of living, prosperous. With the fabled dragon horde of Erebor reclaimed in their kingdom, the dwarves are much richer today than in the past. So we said that cultural blessing, let's just try to, can we just copy this? Cultural blessing, redoubtable. Okay. So this is cultural blessing, dwarf of Durin's folk. Standard of living, we said, was prosperous. I don't have a name yet. So attributes. Choose one set of attributes or roll a success die. Strength, heart, and wits. Well, I could be really strong. I feel like I should be a strong dwarf, but I really feel like also I should have a lot of heart here because I'm kind of thinking about the inspirational dwarf too. Balin, son of Funden. So actually, I'm going to go with... 644. Four. I'm going to go with that one right there. So strength of 6, heart 4, wits 4. So if I go over here, this is where our rating is. So strength of 6, rating for heart 4 and 4. Okay. Okay, now we know that the TN, didn't we see this in several different places? The TN, each TN is equal to 20 minus its corresponding attribute score. So that should allow us to calculate the target numbers for all of our attributes here. Let's see. That would make this 14. 14, there we go. 16. TN 16. And that makes sense because I think we're trying to hit that number or above. So the higher your rating is, the lower the target number. Calculate the following scores based on your chosen attribute ratings. Endurance is strength plus 22, and it's based on the rating. Okay, so that would be 28, right? 6 plus 22. Hope is based on heart plus 8, so that would be 12. Wits would be 10 plus wits, 14. All right. Skills. Copy the listed skill ranks onto the character sheet, then choose one skill among the two underlined and mark it as favored. Okay. So awe, I get two. Athletics, I get one. Awareness, zero. Hunting, zero. Song, one. Crafting, two. Hearten, zero. Travel, three. Insight, zero. Healing, zero. Courtesy, whoop, courtesy one. Battle 1, Persuade 0, Stealth 0, Scan 3, Explore 2, Riddle, was that 2? Yep, 2, and then Lore. Alright, that is a fast way to do skills, but then I'm supposed to choose one of the underlined, which can either be Craft or Travel. Uh, I'm going to go travel. So I'm going to check that one as my favored. So traveled is favored. Okay. Combat proficiencies. Copy the following combat proficiency ranks onto the character sheet, selecting a preferred proficiency when offered a choice. Axes or shields. No, excuse me. Axes or swords. Choose one combat proficiency. Okay. Axes or swords at two. Uh, you you got to go axes. I'm going to go axes. So that's two. And then choose one combat proficiency. Well, I suppose the other one's swords. So there we go. Distinctive features. Choose two distinctive features from among those listed. Cunning, fierce, lordly, proud, secretive, stern, wary, or willful. Where do I put distinctive features here? Oh, distinctive features are up here. Choose two distinctive features. I haven't read all of these, so I don't exactly know what they mean, but with kind of a, a character concept I've got going here, let's go lordly. Let's go lordly and stern. 
Let's do that. Languages and typical names. All dwarves speak the common tongue, but preserve a knowledge of secret dwarvish language. They receive a true name at birth and do not reveal it to members of other folks. They adopt another name in the tradition of their neighbors. This custom has been in use for so long that a number of names have become traditionally associated with dwarves and are used almost exclusively by them. Dwarves of renown are sometimes given an honorific title, celebrating an exceptional deed or distinctive quality, for example, Thorin Oakenshield or Dane Ironfoot. Uh, dwarves, language, is there something about languages in here? I don't see languages, but yeah, let's, uh, let's come up with a, let's come up with a good name. How about Regan? Regan will do the Thunder Fist. So, Regan Thunder Fist. There we go. Sounds pretty good. Then we move on to Elves. Okay, let's go back up to see what we were supposed to be doing, because that was just choosing our heroic culture, was it not? So we recorded a cultural blessing, we determined our attributes, we calculated our strength, heart, and wits target numbers. We did not calculate derived stats yet. No, yes we did. Uh, endurance, hope, and parry were calculated. We recorded our skills and combat proficiency ratings. We chose our distinctive features, and we chose a name. Uh, I don't think I chose an age yet, though, did I? 131. That sound good. All right, so the next thing is answer the call to adventure. Okay, we got to go to page 44, choose a calling, spend previous experience points, choose starting gear, record your valor and wisdom score. Well, this says record your valor and wisdom score as one. Where is valor and wisdom? Oh, right here. Valor one, wisdom one. We can go ahead and do that. Let's go to page 44. Okay, here we are with callings. He found himself wandering at times, especially in the autumn, about the wild lands, and strange visions of mountains that he had never seen came into his dreams. Whatever it is that motivates the player heroes, it must be something that for them is worth the risk of crossing swords with the curved blades of orcs. In the One Ring, this motivation is represented by an adventurer's calling. Choosing a calling provides a player with a starting drive. The reason that pushed their character to become an adventurer is not meant to represent a profession or trade, but the sum of the ambitions and aspirations that eventually set them on the road. There are six callings for a hero to answer. Captain, Champion, Messenger, Scholar, Treasure Hunter, or Warden. Interesting. Okay. Choose a calling that best adheres to the character concept, keeping in mind that coupling each calling to a heroic culture results in 36 combinations. A hobbit treasure hunter has very different reasons to go adventuring than a hobbit scholar, but this is probably even more true if the treasure hunting hunter is a dwarf or elf. All right, cool. Callings follow a standard presentation favored skills. Each calling lists three skills. When you select a calling, you choose two skills among those listed and mark them as favored skills. Okay, additional distinctive features. Those who answer the same calling share a particular ability in the form of a unique distinctive trait. Shadow Path. An adventurer's shadow path suggests the individual's fate a calling typically leads to if they fail to resist the shadow's influence. Interesting. So I guess these are the different ones. So what do I want to be? Captain, Champion, Messenger, Scholar, Treasure Hunter, or Warden? Um, I'm thinking Champion. Let's go Champion. So Champion, war must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. You deemed there is but one way to oppose the return of the shadow, and that is to conquer it by strength of arms. Sounds like my dwarf. You are recognized as a warrior among your folk, a valiant fighter onwards into battle. For you, the road to adventure leads straight to wherever your foes prowl or hide. Favored skills. Choose two skills among athletics, awe, or hunting, and mark them as favored. Okay. Athletics, awe, and hunting. Let's go athletics and awe. Additional distinctive feature, enemy lore. Enemy lore is not a single distinctive feature. You must select the type of enemies it applies to, choosing from evil men, orcs, spiders, trolls, wargs, or undead. This distinctive feature gives you knowledge of the characteristics, habits, strengths, and weaknesses of your chosen enemy. Oh, well, let's go, let's go orcs. Let's be classic here. So this is, what is this called? Lordly, stern, maybe I can put it here. This is an additional distinctive feature, right? Orc enemy lore, or enemy lore, lore orc. All right. Shadow Path, Curse of Vengeance. Individuals who live by the sword are ever tempted to draw it, either literally or figuratively, even when their will is thwarted or when they deem their honor to have been impunged by an insult. As corruption spreads in the spirit, their behavior worsens, leading to more violent and extreme reactions. All right, Curse of Vengeance. 
that was that was Shadow Path. Curse of Vengeance. Okay, moving on. Previous experience, we've had to earn our livings as best we could up and down the land, often sinking as low as blacksmith work or even coal mining. The ability level of newly created player heroes can now be raised to represent their experience prior to their life of adventuring. Players have 10 points to spend on raising skills and combat proficiencies. The cost of raising each ability is shown in the two tables to the right. The first table gives the cost of new skills, while the second shows the cost for combat proficiency levels. Players are free to raise their abilities as they see fit, as long as they have enough points to buy the desired level. Players can also buy ranks and skills or combat proficiencies that their player heroes didn't possess at all, or buy multiple ranks in the same ability, so long as they pay the cost associated with each level individually. Alright, interesting. From nothing to one, from one to two, from two to three, from three to four. Oh, okay, interesting. I got ten points here. All right, let's look at my skills. I do kind of feel like I should be a little bit better with my axe and my sword. So let's start with that. Let's go from two to three, and then from one to two with combat proficiencies. So from one to two is four points. Ooh, it's expensive. Oh, from two to three. Yeah, from two to three is six points. Oh, if I do that, I won't have any left. So I'm not going to do swords. I'll just go up in axes, because after all, I am a champion. So that costs six points. Ooh, okay, so I only have four remaining. I'm kind of interested in this in Harton right here, so, because I, I feel like I should be a little bit inspiring with based on this character concept I have in mind. So from zero to one, that gets me one point. That means I have three left. To go from two to three, that would increase my awe. I'm gonna increase my awe. I don't know if this is a great way to go or not. I kind of have this loose and rather vague character concept of this rather lordly dwarf Yes, who has definitely made his way in the world by killing orcs with the edge of his axe. And so he does have this awe-inspiring effort. He's got athletics here, song, craft, because he's a dwarf, enheartening others. Yeah, I mean, all right, let's, let's try that. Starting gear. He got to Bywater just on the stroke of 11, and he found that he'd come without a pocket handkerchief. All heroes start their adventuring career fully equipped. That's good. War gear. Before the game starts, players get to choose their weapons and armor they want their characters to carry using the war gear list found in the overleaf. More details are found in the gear section. Starting heroes can choose one weapon for each combat proficiency for which they have a rating and their favorite selection of armor, helms, or shields. Okay, so that means that I get an axe and a sword? That sounds pretty good to me. What type of axe do I want? Uh, axe, long-hafted axe, great axe, mattock. You know, I'm kind of tempted to go Matic because that was what the uh, warriors with Dane Ironfoot brought to uh, the Battle of Five Armies. Because I can use that with my axe skill. But I think I'm going to go Long Hafted Axe. Just continue to be kind of classic here. And then I get some kind of sword as well. Uh, short sword. Let's go ahead and add in my information. I got damage here. So... All right, so my damage here with the axe is 18, and that's one-handed, 18 or 20. So I know that's one-handed and two-handed right there. Injury, three. No, no, did I get that wrong? Load is three. Damage, I did. Damage is six. Injury is this 18 slash 20. Okay, this is one or two handed short sword three sixteen one three sixteen one all right and then their favored selection of armor helms or shields how do i know what my favored selection of armor weapons or shields are i don't know players should record their chosen weapons armor and shields on their character sheet paying attention to the following notes uh, okay. I do notice that I have Helm down here already. Does that have something to do with being a dwarf since it's written in already? I don't see that up here talking about dwarves. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it does say that I already have a Helm here, so maybe that is what it's talking about. And maybe that's something that's picked for me. Helmet sounds pretty good anyway. The protection score of a coat of armor is recorded separately from that of a Helm. 
as sometimes during combat a hero may resort to dropping it or reduce the load carried to avoid becoming weary too soon. Shields do not offer direct protection, but make a hero less likely to be hit by providing a bonus to parry. A shield's rating is recorded separately from the main box devoted to parry, as a shield can be smashed by an opponent's blows. So, since it says I have a helm, that says that my protection then would be plus 1d and a load of 4. Protection and a load of four. Traveling gear. A hero's traveling gear includes the belongings that adventurers carry when on a journey. In addition to their weapons and armor in winter, this includes boots and thick warm clothes, a jacket, fur-lined cloak, woolen hose, trousers, and blankets. During the warmer months, the adventurer may do away with the heaviest items and just include light clothes and a cloak. Traveling gear does need to be annotated in detail on a character's sheet only if a player wishes to do so and is not given a load rating. Traveling gear does need to be annotated in detail on a character sheet. Oh, so maybe does not. Traveling gear does not need to be annotated in detail on a character sheet unless a player wishes to do so. Maybe that's what they're talking about here. Then useful items. So I'm just going to skip over that. Useful items. Any tool, instrument, or device carried by the player hero to perform one or more specific tasks is a useful item. Things like a hammer or a hunting knife, a coil of good rope, a lantern or flint and steel to start a fire, and so forth. These are items that may gain the player hero an advantage in game terms, but they may also allow them to do things that could not be done without them. For example, digging a hole in frozen ground can hardly be accomplished without a pickaxe. Players are free to choose useful items, particularly inventing a reason why a particular object is so handy, such as craftsmanship, or it could be a consumable or perishable item like a bottle of liquor or balm. In that case, the player hero is considered to always have a supply that will last for the length of the adventuring phase. Useful items are listed in a character hero's sheet. Let's see, where do I have useful items? I'll put over here uh, warm weather traveling gear. Actually, I'll put autumn. How about that? Weather traveling gear. Oh, my calling up here, that was champion. I didn't note that, but that goes up there. Useful items. I don't see that. Maybe I would put that over here under traveling gear. Let's have... How many am I allowed to have? Oh, all players start the game with a number of useful items based on their standard of living according to the table below. And we said that we are a prosperous person. Oh, so I get three items. Well, it sounds very dwarven. I'll put them down here in adventuring gear. I don't know if that's where they're supposed to go. But I will put flint and steel. I will put mattock. And I will put uh, viola for my singing and musical purposes, for the purposes of song and music. Okay. Load. Selecting the right amount of things to carry is the first test of a hero's medal, and a light pack on a traveler's back is an indication of the experience in the trade. In game terms, the hindrance that, that carried items cause to an adventurer, both in terms of weight and discomfort, is represented by a load. Load is monitored only as far as war gear and treasure is concerned. All heroes are considered to carry without discomfort a reasonable amount of personal items and gear for the life of the trip. Their traveling gear, carried also with the help of their pack animals. Does that include your special items, your useful items? I hope so. An adventurer can carry a load up to the character's maximum endurance. Since the endurance score determines when a hero gets tired, it is generally much wiser to keep that total much lower than the maximum allowed. Players keep track of their hero's load score on their character sheets and must update it should it change during play. If they add or remove pieces of war gear or treasure to what the player hero normally carries, the load rating is immediately adjusted to reflect the increased or reduced burden. Oh, here are some examples of useful items. A knife for skinning rabbits, a coil of rope, windproof lantern, exotic musical instrument, balm to soothe pain, liquor to infuse strength, sunstone, uh, we'll see. Hobbit ponies and full-sized horses. The best asset of an efficient traveling company is an appropriate number of ponies or horses to ride or to employ as baggage carriers. The number and quality of the mounts available to the player heroes depend on the individual standard of living, but are kept track of as a separate as a shared asset. Ponies are sturdy little beasts. They cannot go much faster than a normal walking pace, especially when loaded with stores and tackle, but are good to help the player heroes cope with the toil of spending long hours on the road. Horses can go faster, but few such animals are seen in the north, and most are used as pack animals or draught beasts. So I have Prosperous, so I can bring a decent beast with me? Okay, I got a decent beast. 
The usefulness of ponies and horses as far as journeys are concerned are based on their vigor rating. While traveling, player heroes gain a number of points of travel fatigue as the result of their journey events. At the end of their journey, player heroes traveling with a mount reduce their fatigue total by their beast's vigor rating. Oh, well, that's interesting. That sounds like a pretty easy way to do that rather than trying to deal with a whole bunch of, you know, encumbrance and pounds and things like that. So I am prosperous, so I bring a decent beast which has a vigor rating of 2, it says. Okay. Additionally, ponies and horses can be laden with those riches the player heroes discover in the course of adventuring. Each pack animal can carry treasure up to 10 points of load. All right. Do I put that someplace? I'll just make note of that. I have, what was it called? I'll put that down here. Decent Beast. Starting Reward and Virtue. There are many things that maybe betray the true nature of adventurers. The growth and stature of a hero in terms of power and renown is tracked in the game by using two values, Valor and Wisdom, ranked 1 to 6. At the beginning of the game, we have one in both. Okay, and I already did that. Among their various effects on gameplay, Valor and Wisdom grant a player special abilities. Abilities granted by gaining a new rank in Wisdom are called Virtues, while those gained by an increased rank in Valor are called Rewards. Virtues give the player heroes access to the peculiar adventures of their folk. Rewards are upgraded to enhance a hero's war gear. So since I already start with one, does that mean that I get some? Uh, uh, here's, okay, here it says starting rewards and starting virtues. So I guess since it's starting, I should. So let's say um, that I get them. Where do I put rewards and virtues? Okay, rewards and virtues right here. So let's just choose one from starting rewards. Let's say fell. Weapon. Raise the injury rating of a weapon by two. And let's make that axe. Okay, and then what about a virtue? Starting virtue? Let's go hardiness. Raise your endurance by two. So my endurance is 28. So now it is 30. So now we bring the company together. And the company must choose a patron, a safe haven, determine the company's fellowship rating, and choosing fellowship focus. So I see that up here with patron right here. I don't suppose I have to go through this all this right now, because I haven't got a company together. But we would choose a patron, we would choose a safe haven, we will determine our company's fellowship rating, and then a fellowship focus. Oh, well, okay, let's go Balin, son of Fudenden, all right, because... Captain Champion. Let's just do that. I was thinking about him anyway. So he gets us plus one fellowship points. Fellowship score. So I guess plus one right there. Spend fellowship to make the combat round, a combat roll favored. And we were supposed to reclaim lost strongholds, eliminate enemy lieutenants. All right, that sounds good. Let's see. Safe Haven. The safe haven is the base of operations. In Eriador, the ideal choice for starting safe haven is certainly the village of Bree. The Prancing Pony. Well, I, let's do that. It's not exactly terribly dwarven, but it seems reasonable to operate out of Bree. Actually, I don't see safe haven on here. But we'll just say Bree. The group of player heroes is more than a band of roving mercenaries. Expressed as a numerical value, the Fellowship is a pool of points shared among all player heroes that is mainly spent to recover lost confidence. During an adventuring phase, player heroes can spend the points of Fellowship to recover points of hope when resting. Uh, the starting Fellowship score of a company is equal to the number of player heroes in the group. This value can be augmented by a number of virtues or cultural blessings and as a bonus associated with the patron. So I suppose at the moment, if I am a party of just myself, that would mean that I have a fellowship score of two because it's me plus the bonus for the patron. Fellowship focus. A company's fellowship rating represents the loyalty that adventurers feel toward each other, but some of them might share an additional level of companionship with another member of the company. Such a bond may be due to the respect felt for someone wiser or noble, a special friendship shared by an old acquaintance, the kinship shared with an, a fellow compatriot, the deep affection for a dear family member, or even pity for someone considered to be, of, to be weak or unfit for adventuring. Okay, each player can choose one member of the company as their player hero's fellowship focus. I'm just me right now, so I guess I don't have this. Players can also opt for choosing their fellowship focus later. Okay, maybe when I have some fellows. This does not have to be mutual. In game terms, player heroes provide a greater advantage when they help their fellowship focus. 
Player heroes providing support to their fellowship focus make them gain 2D instead of 1D. But the benefit of caring for someone comes at a price. Player heroes gain one shadow point whenever their fellowship focus is wounded, suffers a bout of madness, or is otherwise seriously harmed. The shadow cannot be prevented with a shadow test. Or this shadow cannot be prevented with a shadow test. Okay. Well, does that mean that I'm, I'm done? I've got my culture, all of this, name. Oh, I don't have anything for flaws. Where do I find flaws? Okay, so looking this up here, it says flaws. Under the pressure of the shadow, heroes can develop flaws, embracing simpler, more primitive emotions, trading respect for arrogance, love for trust, trust for suspicion. Okay, so I don't suppose I have a flaw right now because I have not come under the sway of the shadow. So I guess that explains that, so I just leave that blank. Adventure points and skill points. Didn't I have 10 skill points that I had distributed? Plus there were some other skills that were just uh, chosen for me for being a dwarf of Durin's line. But I believe that's 10, so I guess that's what I put there. Adventure points. I think that I saw adventure points were under experience. Okay, yes, adventure points. The sense of accomplishment of the player heroes, their confidence and skill at arms, their hard-earned respect paid to them by their peers are represented by the award of adventure points. I get three at the end of each adventuring session, whatever it is they do, which we were wondering about that. So I guess at the moment I have zero adventure points. And I also get skill points at the end of adventures, but I think I had 10 total right now. I don't think I have, I, I, I don't have any strange condition right now, weary, miserable, or wounded, or no injuries. So I think that's it. The only thing I want to be sure that I have right are current endurance and current hope. So load, shouldn't I be able to calculate that? Because I've got a, a long hafted axe, which is three, a short sword, which is a load of one, and then I also have a helmet, which is a load of four. So that means I have a load of seven, correct? I'm not supposed to add anything else to that? Okay, two quick things I've noticed that I should have done. I think I've calculated my load incorrectly here because my cultural blessing for being a dwarf of Durin's folk was that I'm redoubtable, which is one of the first things that I wrote down but I had forgotten about at this point. Redoubtable means that I half the load rating for any armor, including helmets that I'm wearing, so that load value of 4 for my helm should have been halved to 2, which means my total load should be 5 here, I believe. I also noticed that although I took Fell with the axe as one of my rewards, I never updated the injury rating of the axe down on the line of the axe in the equipment area, and I would probably want to do that, or I might never remember to increase its injury value because of Fell. So that means the injury of the axe should be 20 with one hand and 22 with two hands. Although, I also noticed that Fell does say that it's for a weapon and not a weapon skill. So now I'm thinking that it should be Fell long hafted axe and not just Fell axe. Please correct me in the comments if I'm incorrect. And I know that my endurance is 30. How do I calculate my fatigue? I suppose at the moment, is it the case that my current endurance is 30? Is that my maximum endurance over here that's 30? So I haven't got started yet, so my current endurance is the same as my maximum endurance? Let's look up fatigue. Okay, here is fatigue. Player heroes accumulate fatigue points when on a journey. Fatigue raises a hero's load total temporarily, making it easier for them to become weary. Oh, okay. So does that mean that at the moment I have a fatigue of zero? Because I'm just getting started here, so I have no fatigue. That's what I'm guessing right here. So current hope. A character's hope score defines the reserves of spiritual vigor that the heroes draw from when in danger. Okay. So kind of the same thing with endurance, I'm guessing. Current hope then would be 12, because I'm just getting started here. Shadow and shadow scars. Shadow, the accumulation of shadow points undermines the hero's hope score of the player heroes, weakening their spirit. Heroes are considered miserable as long as their hope score is equal to or lower than their shadow rating. Okay, so I'm assuming that I'm at zero shadow rating right now. So I start off at zero. And I'm guessing shadow scars too. Heroes can harden their will and trade their current shadow points for a single permanent shadow scar. So I guess I'm going zero there. I have no shadow scars at the moment. So I think I've done it. Have I created a character for the One Ring? I think I got it right. Although, please, everybody, go through this, and I'm sure you will let me know in the comments section if I've gotten something wrong or if I'm not doing something right. So please let me know. But hopefully this is helpful to everyone. I think I have a complete character ready to go. I suppose minus the drawing of the character that I'd put in here. But there we go. I think that's it. 
fun and enjoyable, I think. I don't know how long it's exactly taken me to go through this uh, character creation process, maybe about an hour here total, but I think that if I knew what I was doing and I was experienced with it, you know, I like to be able to create characters in 20 minutes or less. Probably if I knew what I was doing, I probably could. Uh, I think that could be the case. I do like the fact that it has, okay, are you taking dwarf? Are you taking champion? Okay, great. Add these things to your character sheet. Because those are the choices that you're making. Because, because I like faster character creation, because I want to be able to get people to the table and get people playing, uh, I don't want there to be just a, a million different options for everybody to choose at different states. You know, it was saying that the combination of, I think it was something like, calling along with culture represents 36 different combinations anyway, and then you can assign 10 skill points any way that you want anyway for further variation. You know, to me, that's probably enough for the purposes of what kinds of games I'm trying to play now. Storytelling focused, get to the game, get adventuring, get to the table fast kinds of games. And that still provides a tremendous amount of variety without having to pick all of your different skills individually or something like that. So at the whole, on the moment, I am still pleased with what's going on here. I, I like this, and I'm still looking forward to uh, getting to play and try it out. Please let me know if there are any problems or anything like that with what I've done here, so other people will know as well. I really appreciate it. And if you've enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, all of that jazz, but please click to go to my YouTube channel because I've got over a hundred videos there about tabletop gaming and fantasy, and I would love to have you for them. And if you enjoyed this video, you will probably enjoy a lot of them as well. I look forward to seeing you in those videos and many more to come. Later.